on Qadiani uh, Jesus, the Ahmadiyya position on Jesus and whenever Jesus is mentioned we say in the Quran Isa ibn Maryam, Isa son of Maryam and alayhi salatu wa salam, Shahid Kamal, uh, he is our invited speaker inshallah, we request him to commence his presentation and thereafter inshallah we will uh, give you a conclusion and summary. Jazakallah khair. Very nice to see some uh, friendly and familiar faces. Jazakallah khair Sheikh for inviting me to talk on a subject in which I, I must confess to not being an expert in any other sense that I was um, uh, Qadiani Ahmadi for most of my life. Some of you will have heard me speak before so I'm going to cut to the chase. Inshallah I'm just going to talk about what the official uh, Qadiani Ahmadiyya position is on Jesus. Now the reason I'm using the word Jesus is because Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the founder of Ahmadiyya himself, differentiates between Jesus of the Bible and Isa Islam on several occasions. So it's important to know that the Ahmadiyya themselves have a position on Jesus that is mired in this very interesting duality. And this duality always plays a central role in Mirza's own teachings on his own status. So he himself, as you know, claimed to be first the, the image. So um, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad had a series of ascending claims, as you're probably aware. And one of those earlier claims was that he came in the image, image of uh, the Masih. And later on he claimed to be the Masih himself and of course he continued to have ever more ascending claims. So this is a very, very brief background on, on Ahmadiyya and Jesus. And the, the third point on the use of the title Qadiani Jesus is of course that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad himself claimed to be uh, the uh, second coming, if you like, of Isa alayhi salam. So I'm going to talk about what the actual position of the Ahmadiyya is. And this is taken from my own knowledge. This is how I grew up understanding the concept of Isa al Islam, which in, when I was an Ahmadi, I found very logical. Of course, I, I wasn't aware of the Muslim position at the time. I was only aware of the Ahmadiyya position, but it sounded logical to me at the time. I didn't delve too much deeper. There are notable points of difference between the Qadiani Ahmadiyya position on the life and mission of Isa al-Islam and the Muslim position. And I think one of the things to make clear is that it's not that we oppose um, the position of Ahmadiyya purely because of it being um, outside of the fold of Islam. Rather, we oppose um, these because they, they are um, self-contradicting statements as well. So there are a number of angles in which you can approach this subject. The first is, well, obviously, uh, Qadianism is, is declared by the consensus of the ulama to be completely outside the fold of Islam. It's recognized as a cult increasingly by um, more and more secular organizations as well as spiritual authorities. Um, and, and on that basis, we can delve deeper and look at some of the more interesting uh, issues like, where did these beliefs come from? Where did the, the concept of Isa al Islam come from uh, in, in the theology, if you like, of Ahmadiyya? So I'm going to explore that. The first point of difference, and it's a slight point, is on the aspect of the virgin birth. The Ahmadis believe that uh, the, the virgin birth, uh, that is, um, Maryam, um, on whom be peace, um, giving birth, 
having been not touched by any man was true. So they believe in this concept. But what they say is that they don't believe it was a miracle in the sense that it was a supernatural event. What they say is that this birth could be described in scientific terms at some point. So whether we agree or disagree with that is not the issue. The issue is the major point of difference between Islam and uh, Qadiani Ahmadiyya on this is that um, the Ahmadiyya in general has this notion that miracles are not miracles in the way we see them. They are always bound by the laws of the universe which are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is a major difference and the reason for this is it, it kind of sets at the center of the universe a creator who is pretty much a, a, the, the model believed in by deists. Now I don't know if anyone has ever heard of the, the term deism, but it was kind of a 17th, 18th century doctrine where some philosophers believed that God set the universe up and then let it be. In fact, Isaac Newton believed this for quite a while, that God basically set the universe up, set up all the rules, all the laws, and everything behaved like billiard balls in a very, very predictable way. So the Qadiani Ahmadiyya position on the virgin birth is that it was not a supernatural event outside the already prescribed laws, but that one day we'll be able to explain this law. And as I said, miracles in general in the Ahmadiyya are not believed to be supernatural events. Whereas in Islam, the orthodox view is of course that a miracle is a supernatural event where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do whatever he likes at any point. Um, and of course, given that this is a very, the Ahmadiyya position is such a deistic position, that also kind of goes against the Quran where we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sustains the universe from moment to moment. The second, the moment he withdraws his will, from the sustenance of the universe, he withdraws his risk, that's it, game over, the universe will disappear in an instant. It will not be susceptible to any laws that will cause it to grind to a halt or start contracting. We believe, as Muslims, the Quran is very explicit on this, that Allah, the sustainer, our Rabb, sustains the universe on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So that in itself runs contrary to this idea that uh, we have a clockwork universe, which kind of is one position that the Ahmadiyya take. They also take another position as well, but not related to this. As you'll see, their views are quite contradictory. So, are, are we clear on that? The, the way the Ahmadiyya see the birth of Isa al -Islam is that, yes, it was a miracle, but they don't think miracles are really miracles. They think they can be explained scientifically. Now, let's quickly have a look at the um, miracles of Isa alayhi salam um, as described in the Quran. I'm using the Aisha Buli translation um, into English, which I think is the, the best one out there, but I digress. So, um, uh, so starting from 346, when the angel said, Maryam Allah gives you good news of a word from him. His name is the Messiah, Isa, son of Maryam, of high esteem in this world and the next world, and one of those brought near. He will speak to people in the cradle, and also when fully grown, and will be one of the righteous. She said, My Lord, how can I have a son when no man has ever touched me? He said, It will be so. Allah creates whatever he wills. When he decides on something, he just says to it, Be and it is. He will teach him the book and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel as a messenger to the tribe of Israel saying, I have brought you a sign from your Lord. I will create the shape of a bird out of clay for you and then breathe into it and it will be a bird by Allah's permission. I will heal the blind and lepers and bring the dead to life by Allah's permission. I will tell you what you eat and what you store up in your homes. There is a sign for you in that if you are Mu'minun. So, you know, a description of some of the miracles of Isa al Islam qualified very clearly by the term by Allah's permission, with Allah's permission. So, we believe in every single letter of the Quran. It is explicit on the miracles of Isa al Islam. We accept them explicitly without any qualification or reservation. So, what is the 
Ahmadiyya position on the mission of Isa al Islam? Well, they believe that he had uh, a limited scope. His mission was of limited scope. That it was where the Israelites live. And of course, one of the interesting variations is that they believe that 10 of the tribes of Israel were lost. And they traveled to Afghanistan, to China, to Kashmir, to India, etc. And that some of their descendants are still living there to this day. This is one of their beliefs, and this is what, what they believe, that his, his mission was bounded. Now one of the reasons they say that his mission was bounded was um, in order to um, rebut the idea that Isa al-Islam will descend at the end of time um, and come as uh, someone who prays behind the, our Imam at the time, which there are, uh, I believe, mutawatir hadith on this that he will come to the Imam of the time and um, he will push the Imam forward and say, no, you lead the prayer. So one of the interesting extrapolations by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was that Gadian is actually to the east of Damascus and that he therefore fulfilled the criteria laid out in this hadith. And uh, one Gadiani recently online tried to make a point of this by drawing a line using Google Maps from Damascus to Gadian, perfectly straight line. Uh, I looked up the latitudes of the two places and of course there was some variation. The line was not perfectly straight, it had been faked. There's actually about 110 kilometers difference. You'd hit several other cities or towns or places before you hit Gadian. So, um, I, I, I mean, the, I, I cannot describe this uh, particular um, deviation, if you like, to the founders of the Ahmadiyya, but Mirza Ghulam Muhammad did himself say that, you know, is, is Qadiyan not to the east of Damascus? Thus twisting the words of the Hadith. This is playing with the words of the Prophet ﷺ. And we know what happens if someone plays with the words of the Prophet ﷺ, do we not? You know, that person will have to occupy their seat in hellfire. This is a very, very scary thing, and this was done on many occasions. But again, I digress. I'm, I'm going to try and stick to uh, this, the subject, which is what is the official position. So the official position is that the mission of Isa al-Islam was restricted to uh, the, the tribes of Israel, and that ten of those tribes were lost, and that therefore he continued his mission by traveling east, and uh, there were ten tribes in these various countries that I've mentioned already, and this is where he continued to spread his message to after he allegedly survived the crucifixion. So let's talk about the crucifixion. Um, the the Qadiani Ahmadiyya actually believe, and the Lahori, Lahori Ahmadiyya also, I have to say, also believe that uh, Isa al-Islam was put on the cross. This is a crucial difference between the position of Muslims and the position of the Ahmadiyya, of all groups of the Ahmadiyya, the Qadianis and Lahoris alike, and all of the other, I believe most of the other subgroups, I can't speak for all of them, that they believe that Isa al was actually put on the cross and survived the crucifixion. Um, and in order to uh, justify this position, they use the Bible to support their position. So any evidence that they, they use does not come from the Muslim position in any way. It comes from the Bible. So they use the Bible to justify this, this unusual position. Um, it is a very unusual position. Obviously the Christians have a different view on the crucifixion altogether. No other group, as far as I'm aware, has this kind of view. Um, though the view was propounded uh, a few years earlier by um, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Is that right? He believed that he, he pr propounded the swoon theory and several other uh, so-called scholars at the time also propounded the swoon theory, which was that um, Isa al-Islam was placed on the cross, that he didn't die on the cross, he survived, and um, then there are variations as to what happened after that point. But the Qadiani Ahmadiyya, Lahori Ahmadiyya, and maybe some other divisions as well believe that uh, Isa al -Islam was placed on the cross, survived the cross, and traveled east, where he continued his mission. So what happened, according to the Ahmadiyya, after the crucifixion that they say took place? Well, as I say, they believe that the lost tribes 
of Israel are actually East, in Kashmir, in Afghanistan, uh, in India, in China. They also believe that the tomb of Isa, where they propose that he died aged 120 after finishing his mission, is. Um, they believe that the tomb that, is, that currently has a name of a saint called Yuz Asaf on it, in Srinagar, in Kashmir, um, is actually the tomb of Isa alayhi salam. That is their position. Now, earlier on I talked about the position of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad on the biblical figure of Jesus and the duality with Isa alayhi salam, the figure of the Qur'an and the real figure. Well, there are several issues that are brought up by using this duality. And the reason I bring up the duality is because the figure of Jesus, the biblical Jesus, was attacked horribly by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. I mean, there was truly some shocking language, and the, the Sheikh mentioned some of this language before. And the excuse used by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and his defenders since is that oh, it's, it's okay because this is not the real Jesus, and we only started doing this because. Um, they were attacking, the Christians at the time were attacking Muslim figures of respect, including the Prophet ﷺ and his wives. May Allah be pleased with all of them. And I'm going to cover um, some of those issues. They have a very subtle uh, other defense as well, in that um, th this is not the real Isa alayhi salam that he was referring to. So whatever abuse he meant was for a conceptual figure only and not a real figure of any, uh, of any kind of imagination. Um, but here's a problem with that approach. As you know, there are several schisms within the Ahmadiyya community, including the Qadianis and the Lahoris, who are the two major factions. Now, if the Lahori Ahmadis or somebody else, for example, were to attack the, the Lahori version of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who according to the Lahoris is not a prophet, would that be acceptable? Would it be acceptable to cast aspersions on Mirza Ghulam Ahmad as a figure from any other point of view? Because one or other group was going to be offended. Doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, it's the same Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. It's, it's not right for me to say, oh, it's okay, I'm attacking the Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of the Lahoris. No, the person that you're attacking is the same person. Just because you're saying, oh, it's your version of the person, in order to use mockery as a device for effect, is not reasonable. It's not reasonable for a Muslim to take this position. Have Muslims taken this position? Yes, some Muslims in the past have taken this position. Some Muslims have used a little bit of mockery. Um, in, in order to uh, rebut or um, choke back the advances of the Christian missionaries. But is it the right thing to do? No, probably not. It's probably not the correct Muslim etiquette to do this. So this defense that, oh, it was only the, the biblical version of uh, Jesus that we were attacking is not an acceptable defense. Um, so here's, here's a quote that I think we went over a similar quote earlier. Uh, but Mirza Ghulam Ahmad said, however, who would be wise and pious if we would consider such a person as pious-hearted who does not refrain from touching young women? A beautiful prostitute is sitting so close to him, almost embracing him. Sometimes she massages his head with perfume or holds his feet. At other times, she lays her beautiful black hair on his feet and plays in his lap. In that condition, Mr. Messiah is sitting in ecstasy. If someone rises to object, he is scolded. In addition to his youth, dependency on alcoholic beverages, and being a bachelor, a beautiful prostitute is lying in front of him, touching her body against his. Is this the behavior of a virtuous person? And what evidence or proof is there that Jesus did not get sexually provoked by the prostitute? The sexual excitement and arousal had done its work to the fullest. This is the reason why Jesus could not even open his mouth to say, Oh, adulteress, keep away from me. Now, the, the argument of... Uh, Gardiani Ahmadi apologists, and there, there are written works on their website on this, make it clear that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad is attacking the biblical figure and using this as a device of rhetoric, which one could argue 
is in itself, in pure debating terms, a reasonable defense. But is this a defense that a Muslim could use? Is this the language? Say, for example, Sheikh Suleiman is speaking to uh, a Christian. Uh, could you use this kind of language in any kind of polite debate or discussion about the religion? Would this be the right sort of approach? This is Sheikh Suleiman. Sheikh Suleiman is one of the most learned scholars in our country, mashallah, but he doesn't claim to be a saint or even a prophet. This man almost claimed godhood. In fact, he did have a revelation where he said, I imagine myself to be God and I was shaping the universe and so forth and so forth. Um, so my point here is not that this is, uh, this has not been done by other people, has been done by other people. Other people have used this device. Um, but is it worthy of a decent Muslim to use this kind of approach? No. Could a prophet speak like this? Absolutely not. Now, there is another very important reason why we cannot refer to Jesus in such vile terms. Does anyone know what, what this reason is? It's He's a prophet. He's a prophet. He's a prophet. <laughs> no, the Jesus of the Bible. Well, you're right. I mean, that's, that's, that's another good reason. But there's something very explicit. I'm going to go forwards uh, a little bit. Actually, no, let, let's carry on a bit. I'll come back to that. Remind me to tell you exactly why this is such a big deal. Um, so let, let me cover some, some more quotes. And the reason I want to get to these quotes is because the defense was, remember what the defense was? That Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was attacking the biblical figure of Jesus. Well, here's a different story. And listen to the wording used to describe Isa al Islam. The root cause of all the damage that alcohol consumption has had on the Europeans was that Isa al Islam used to drink alcohol, perhaps because of some disease or an old habit. When he says Isa al Islam, is he referring to the biblical Jesus or is he referring to the real Isa al Islam? So that, that cannot be used as a defense. I'll, I'll come to the Ahmadiyya defense for this position soon, inshallah. A man who drinks wine so long as he lives and likes the company of women of dubious character, sinners and drunkards, does not present an example worthy of emulation. This was said in the context of referring to Isa al-Islam. Don't you know that manliness and virility are praiseworthy attributes of men? Being a eunuch is not a commendable quality just as being deaf and dumb are not commendable. Yes, this objection is indeed very great, that Hazrat Masih alayhi salam being completely deprived of manhood could not leave a practical example of a perfect and upright social life with his wives. So this is a direct attack on Isa alayhi salam. Now the defense, and I've read the defense, is that in the context that this was used, he was still referring to the biblical Jesus. Well I say, be very, very careful when you're talking about a messenger of God. If I was writing about a messenger of God, I would be extremely careful with my language. <coughs> extremely careful. As I'm sure we would all be. I can't imagine anyone in this room using this kind of language about a prophet of God. To us, they're, they're all messengers, pro sorry, they're all prophets of God and we venerate them equally as we've been commanded to do. So, here's a little bit of balance because this has not been done before. Nobody has said, well, you know what? This is not actually Mirza Ghulam Ahmad's stated position. So here is some balance for you. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad in, in his book, uh, well, a kind of a letter, um, said, the Messiah is one of the most beloved and righteous servants of God. He is among those who are chosen by God. He belongs to those whom God purifies with his own hand and whom he keeps under the shelter of his light. But he is not God, as is presumed. Yes, he is close to God and is among those perfect ones who are the few. That's really nice, isn't it? And that's much better. That's the way you should speak about Isa al Islam. But um, my uh, wonderful and beloved friends from Khatam and Nabu there probably can't see the writing at the bottom. Can you see? Tofa Kaisaria. Now, they know what this is. Why is he being so nice about Isa al Islam here? This was a letter to Queen Victoria, a present for the Empress. So he wanted to impress her with his love for her God. Okay? That was the context. It's very important. Every time that he used a certain amount of um, abuse, the context was uh, the presence of, for example, Christian missionaries or Muslims, uh, Muslim scholars who he labeled mullahs. 
Um, but when he was writing to the Queen and so forth, he took on a different approach. Now look, this is perfectly normal. I do it all the time, okay? But I ain't claiming prophethood any time soon. God forbid. This man was a claimant of prophethood. This man was uh, one who claimed that he was, he came back in the, not just in the image of Jesus, but he was a Messiah himself. He also claimed that he was the second coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He claimed that God named him Ibrahim alayhi salam, Maryam, the, all sorts of things that he claimed. So such a model of perfection surely should be very careful and very consistent about the language that they use, the context in which they use that language, and who they address the language to. What does the Qur'an say? Remember what I was saying earlier about remind me about why this is so important? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us explicitly in 6 108, and do not abuse those whom they call upon besides Allah, lest exceeding the limits they should abuse Allah out of ignorance. Thus have we made fair seeming to every people their deeds. Then to their Lord shall be their return, so he will inform them of what they did. Do not abuse their gods. And what is Jesus to the Christians? He is part of the Trinity. He is part of Godhead. He is the son of God to the Christians. And he is, as far as they're concerned, a part of the triune, which is three units of God in one. Now, whether or not we agree with this principle, and of course we don't as Muslims, we are firmly on Tawheed as Muslims, we are not allowed to abuse the gods of people who have other religions, people who have uh, the qualities of the Mushrikeen. We are not allowed to do it. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us explicitly. So, my question to you, brothers, can a prophet of God go against a direct commandment of the Qur'an? Absolutely not. Ergo, he was not a prophet of God. He could not be the second coming of Isa alayhi salam. On this principle alone, the argument is finished. But this is not about the theology of Ahmadiyya uh, on a wider level. This is about the specific theology as it relates to Isa alayhi salam and the biblical figure of Jesus as well. But on that point alone, this is not acceptable from a Qur'anic perspective either. And there is a very, very famous hadith which uh, Sheikh Suleiman knows about and my um, brothers from Khatman Nabuwa know about, about 30 liars or their about uh, uh, Dajalin, the Jalun, appearing in the lifetime of the Ummah, each claiming to be a prophet, but there is no prophet after me. So the Prophet ﷺ was explicit that there would be many people claiming to be prophets after him. And Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, in the opinion of the scholars, as a consensus of the ulama of all of al Sunnah wal Jamaa, in fact, outside of al Sunnah wal Jamaa as well, uh, categoric that Ahmadiyya is outside of Islam for several reasons, but uh, the claim of prophethood is one of the key ones. So, talking of the claim, um, uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad claimed that he was to the Muslim dispensation or the Muhammad dispensation what Isa was to the Mosaic dispensation. In other words, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad claims he was the last of the Khalifas and also the last <coughs> prophet in the chain of Muhammad in the same way that Isa was the last prophet in the chain of uh, the law of or the Sharia of Musa So this is a complete, uh, a completely at odds with the position of Islam. This is something that's very important. When you hear um, the Qadiani's claim, because the Lahori's won't claim this, of course. The Lahori's don't believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was a prophet. When you hear the Qadiani's claim that they are Muslims who believe in the Messiah, ask them which Messiah? If someone ever says, we're, yeah, we're Muslims who believe in the Messiah. Well, all Muslims believe in the Messiah, but the Messiah is Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. That is the only Messiah that the, the Muslims are aware of. And, you know, if you're with the majority, the majority view, the, uh, the consensus in the Ummah today, and amongst the ulama, as far as I'm aware, is that the only person that's going to return at the end times is the very same Isa alayhi salam. Another very concerning um, point of differentiation is that the Ahmadiyya believe that the Ahmad in the Qur'an refers to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Now, I don't know the, the relevant verse, but um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does mention in the Qur'an that 
Isa al -Islam told his people of a prophet to come after him whose name would be Ahmad and Muslims believed that this Ahmad was Muhammad sallallahu Ahmad is just a derivation of Muhammad anyway, the same triliteral root applies to the two names. But the other thing to bear in mind um, is that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad's name was not Ahmad, it was Ghulam Ahmad. Now any of you with a subcontinental background will understand what I'm talking about here. But I'll tell you from an English perspective. There is a name in English called Robertson, right? And the derivation is that you call someone Robertson who was a son of Robert. Now, you can't change Robertson into Robert or Roberts. Can't do it. You can't suddenly say, well, I'm not Robertson, I'm Roberts. Hello? You just pulled a fast one on me. That's, that's not allowed. In the same way, the way they get around this, the way the, um, the scholars of Ahmadiyya, I hesitate to call them scholars, but they are, they are scholars who study Ahmadiyya. The way they get around it is they, they say, well, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Mirza Ghulam Ahmad revelation and told him he was Ahmad. In the same way that he told him that he was Muhammad. But I think that's a bit shifty because they're specifically referring to Ahmad and they don't often use the word Muhammad to refer to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Why not just come out and say it? Why not just say that his name was Muhammad and not Mirza Ghulam Ahmad? So this is a little bit of deception that's employed. Whenever you hear the term Hazrat Ahmad being used by um, the Qadiani Ahmadiyya, in fact the Lahori Ahmadiyya will use this term as well, you have to pull them up on and say, hey, hold on, his name was not Ahmad, his name was Ghulam Ahmad. And he signs himself as Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. He also claimed to be the last messenger. So that tells you very clearly that this is something that will take uh, anyone who has this as a part of their Iman outside the fold of Islam. We know that if you go against any part of the Quran, as far as um, Muslims are concerned, you are immediately outside the fold of Islam. You cannot say, La ilaha illallah, and also believe in five gods, can you? It's impossible. You can't do this. You can't hold that belief. You, you can't say, right, La ilaha illallah, right, there are no gods but God, uh, Muhammad Rasulullah, uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last, is a, um, is, a messenger, is a messenger of God, not the last, but you can't then, you can't say that and then say um, that I now believe that there is another prophet because that goes against Quran. You can't say the, the Shahada and then say, I believe alcohol is perfectly permissible when the Quran has made it impermissible. There are many conditions to the Shahada and the conditions are that you go by Quran and Sunnah and those conditions are contained in there. So anytime you violate any of those conditions, for example, the Prophet ﷺ made very, very clear there'd be no prophet after him. He also said in a hadith, I don't know the whole hadith off by heart, but uh, he referred to himself as Al-Aqib, the, the last, um, and he said, I am Muhammad, I am Ahmad, I am the Ifaisa. So he clearly names himself Ahmad as well. There is no confusion on this issue. So a, a lot of little tricks are employed by people who try to um, get around some of the thorny issues of Ahmadiyya theology and you should be aware of each and every one of them. So this uh, thankfully is the uh, verse I was referring to, 61.6 and when Isa, son of Maryam said, tribe of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah to you, confirming the Torah which came before me and giving you the good news of a messenger after me whose name is Ahmad, who was a messenger after Isa alayhi salam. Salam <clears throat> so, he claimed to be this Ahmad and his followers have since claimed that he is this Ahmad um, and, they, and for that reason they call themselves Ahmadi. Um, the reason we take offense at the term Ahmadi, I didn't know this before by the way, I used to routinely use the term Ahmadi a few years after I left, was because, well, Ahmad is the name of the Prophet wasallam. And so, strictly speaking, an Ahmadi is a follower of the Prophet ﷺ. You cannot actually be an Ahmadi um, without being a Muslim. If you call yourself Ahmadi, it means you are a prophet, follow the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. You cannot be the follower of a Prophet Ahmad who is not Muhammad, because there is no other Prophet called Ahmad who is not Muhammad. And as I say, Mirza's name was not Ahmad, his name was Ghulam Ahmad. So very, very important that you know this distinction. Why we refer to them as Qadianis? Well, 
I was asked this by somebody recently, somebody quite senior. I, I can't reveal the identity of this person, but it was an official. An official wanted to know um, why they found the term Qadiani offensive. So I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not sure why they find the term Qadiani offensive, because um, there is a principle that if somebody says, I find this offensive and you shouldn't use it, that you should listen to them. That is reasonable to do that. But I gave them an example. Let's say, for example, there is a small cult that just forms. And the cult says, we are Christians, but their, their name is actually, they're, they're followers of a man called, I don't know, Robertson, right? So the, the Christians say, well, these are the, the Robertsonians, right? But the Robertsonians say, no, we are the Christians. You Christians aren't Christians at all. You're kuffar. Would it be reasonable for the Christians to refer to this tiny splinter group, this cult, as anything other than Robertsonians? Would it be reasonable for them to say, you are Christians, yes? No. So we can't call them Ahmadi, because an Ahmadi is a follower of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu I didn't understand this before. I had, to, <laughs> I had to really learn about this. There's so many subtleties. But until you love the Prophet sallallahu more than you love your own family, until you inculcate that love in your heart, you don't understand these things. And I didn't. To me, he was a man from 1400 years ago. This man from 100 years ago was closer to me. I didn't know him, but this is how I believed. <coughs> so how can you have this diluted love and claim that you have more love for Muhammad wasallam than any other person, including any member of your own family? It's not possible, is it? Your love becomes diluted. So, getting back to the point, there have been quite a few other Ahmads in India since the 15th century who have claimed, who have made enormous claims. Um, claims to be Messiah, claims to be uh, guides, reformers, etc. Um, some of them are listed up there, I won't go through them, but Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was just one of the four. What do prophets do? Yes. What else do they do? What do prophets do? It's not a trick question, by the way. <laughs> Teach people the right path. Yes. The oneness of God. Yes, very important. The oneness of God. They call to the oneness of God. The most important thing is the calling to the oneness of God. Okay? That's the message of God. Yes. That's the ultimate message. God is one. This is, we, we are hardcore monotheists, right? If you want to call us hardcore about anything, if you want to call us extreme about anything, uncompromising about anything, it's Tawheed, right? Now, what did uh, the Jesus of the Bible do? He overturned the moneylenders' tables. Another thing that prophets do is they overturn the social order. They are seen as troublemakers. They're told, don't do this, you know? We'll give you some money if you just stop doing what you're doing. Right? But they will never compromise on their principles, on their message, because they are accountable to a higher authority. They will never, ever compromise. Ever. They will not. That is satanic. It is impossible for a prophet of God to compromise on their principles. The Jesus of the Bible is one of my favorite stories and totally applicable to the financial mess that we're in today. He overturned the moneylender's tables. That is an act of violence. It is a beautiful act of violence that you should go up to somebody who is stealing money from people, who is making poor people poorer and rich people richer, and you're overturning the table. This kind of violence in my book is acceptable for a prophet of God. If you overturn something like a table which has got filth on it, money stolen from poor people to give to the rich people, that's what he did. He was not afraid. He was weak. It's not like he went in there to kind of hurt anybody. This is, and remember, this is a biblical story, so I, I don't have any uh, Quranic confirmation of this. But according to the biblical account, he overturned the moneylenders' tables. Now, what did Mirza Ghulam Ahmad do? What was his position with respect to authority? This is the same letter I was referring to earlier, the Tafaya uh, Kaisariya, which is sent in 1897 on the occasion of, I think, the Golden Jubilee of Queen Victoria. He says, to teach people the way of true love for and servitude to their creator, and to explain to people the way of true obedience to their monarch, the exalted queen, whose subjects they are. 
We pray that may he keep secure for long our exalted Queen, Empress of India, who has the different nations of her subjects in her benevolent embrace, and from whose single being comfort is being provided to millions of people. This prayerful person who has come into this world with the name of Isa Masih is proud of the being of the exalted Queen, Empress of India and her era. Now, this, this is one of the most fawning letters to authority you will ever see. It's one thing to be respectful of authority, and we all should be respectful. As Muslims, we should be respectful of authority. But what need was there for this letter to an occupier who had stolen the wealth of India? In, in India, at around this time, for a period of around 20 to 30 years, as a direct result of British maladministration, tens of millions of people starved to death. Nobody knows about this today. Did you know this? Did you know that tens of millions of Indians starved to death because of British maladministration in the late portion of the 19th century? Hands up, who knew this? Did anyone know this? It's a little bit. Just a little. No, I didn't know the figure that we knew that. Yeah. Um, read a book by Mike Davis called uh, The Late Victorian Holocausts to get a picture of, for example, not too far from Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was preaching his message that there were soldiers shooting people, protecting bags that were being exported back to Britain from India. The starving people wanted this grain, but they were being shot. This is what was going on. So at this time, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad could have been writing saying, can you please sort out your administration? But he did not do this. Instead, he wrote this fawning letter, which is not the kind of thing that a prophet does, in my opinion. So, earlier on I referred to him praising Isa Islam in one of his letters, and this was the letter that he wrote to Queen Victoria, and it was in that letter that he praised Queen Victoria that he also praised Isa Islam. But that is not the position that he takes in other written material. According to the Bible, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But Mirza Ghulam Ahmad said, The majority of people who joined my sect are those who are either holding eminent posts within the British court, or the goodly rich men. Their servants and friends or businessmen, lawyers, or those educated in the modern way, or such famous scholars, servants and noblemen, who have either served the British government in the past, or are serving it at present, or their relation, etc., etc., etc. Basically what he's doing, uh, this is in a poster. Is he saying that his followers are, are wealthy and upright members of society? But who were the first followers of um, the prophets? Were they the rich people or were they the poor people? It's always the poor. The prophets uphold justice. And justice also includes financial justice. So, basically, he ends this letter by saying, in short, this is a party which is a protégé of the British government from whom it has earned good name and who is worthy of the government's favours. Basically he's saying, I, I want favours from the British government for this party. So, who is the, the Qadiani Jesus? Who is the Qadiani Messiah? Final quote that I'll end with from, from Riza Ghulam Ahmad that really had me rocking in my belief in Ahmadiyya. God named me Mary in the third volume, Brahim Ahmadiyya. I was nurtured for two years as Mary and was raised in a womanly seclusion. Then, the spirit of Jesus was breathed into me just as was done with Mary. Hence, I was considered to be pregnant in a metaphorical manner. After a period of several months, not exceeding ten, I was made Jesus out of Mary by the revelation embodied in the last part of the fourth volume of Brahim Ahmadiyya, and thus I became Jesus, son of Mary. But God did not inform me of this secret at that time. So, um, unusual to say the least. Unusual. Very unusual. Um, what was his purpose? He said that he came to break the cross. But actually Christianity increased during his time in India. Christianity increased. It is now stronger than ever in India. Christianity is growing fast in the world. Um, anyone go to any of the Aira events? 
Pi era. You ever heard of this uh, Dawa organization? They were, I went to one yesterday, and interestingly, they were talking about where I met Sheikh Suleiman, I'm very happy to say. Happy coincidence. Where they mentioned um, an organization called the Campus uh, Crusades Corps, or something like that. I'll have to look them up again. They get $667 million a year in donations. They have 25,000 full-time missionaries and 250,000 volunteers. This is serious. This is a Christian Dawah organization of incredible power and financial muscle. Did Mirza Ghulam Muhammad do his job if he was a messiah? Doesn't look like it. But here's a real deal. This is what um, interests me the most about the Ahmadiyya position. Whether or not you accept um, the Ahmadiyya position on whether Jesus died or not, and the mainstream Muslim view is that Isa al Islam was raised alive bodily. Whether or not you accept that, whether or not you buy into any of that weird stuff, is there any internal consistency in that position? And where did that position come from? There's a guy called Nicholas Notovich, who was an aristocrat. And he came up with the whole theory that Jesus had gone to India several years before Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was confronted about this and goes, no, 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 I didn't know anything about this guy. Um, yeah, you did. Um, so Sayyid Ahmad Khan's tafsir several, for, predated Mirza Ghulam Ahmad's position on the swoon by several years. Was it, I think eight years before, maybe more, that he came up with this idea. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad at the time said that he believed in the ascent of Isa al In fact, for the majority of his life, he held this view. It was only later in his life that he suddenly realized, oh, hold on a minute, I am the Messiah, and started to proclaim this um, errant belief. But the fact is that during his time where he believed in Isa al being bodily alive in heaven, he had read these interesting bits of conspiracy theory by other people and became a conspiracy theorist himself. Some of his ideas were plagiarized, in my opinion. Um, and some of the people that he kind of followed were crackpots at the time. They were like the, the conspiracy nuts of today that you see. Um, and he kind of meshed and molded some of these theories into what is now the Ahmadiyya position on Isa al-Islam. So the question you have to ask yourself, I think, is not so much is the theology of Ahmadiyya on Isa al-Islam valid? That in itself is asking to get involved in a series of debates and lectures in which we are not qualified. Many of us are not scholars. Most of us are not scholars. In fact, some of the, the greatest scholars in the world are so humble, mashallah, that they themselves say, we are not scholars. And you're looking at these people and thinking, it take me 2,000 years to learn as much as you've learned. You know? And these people are so humble. But they themselves will not come up with this kind of stuff. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad had a different kind of reading. He read many, many different, from many different sources. And he kind of put these things together and um, came up with these weird ideas. And if you have a look at some of these sources, feel free to check up on them. Most of the information I've got is from the official Ahmadiyya website. If you check up on the sources, you'll see how these people were seen as crackpots. Nicholas Notovich, for example, who came up with the idea of Jesus going to India in the first place, was, um, was seen by many to be a complete fraud that he fabricated the entire story of him having anything to do with this. Um, nobody accepts uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan's tafsir of the Qur'an. Uh, there are modern day people who do the same sort of thing. For example, uh, we have uh, a writer whose name escapes me for the moment, a modern journalist who has also done a kind of his own tafsir completely off the top of his head. These are not legitimate tafsir, they're just personal interpretations, which is fine. If they want to do that, that's not a problem. But when somebody says, not only am I going to come up with my own ideas, I'm going to claim that I'm a prophet and spread them, then that takes them out of Islam. So when you do discuss uh, Ahmadiyya theology, particularly on the issue of Jesus, ask them more about, well, where did Mirza Ghulam Ahmad get his ideas from? They'll say, God. Well, they'll say, well, okay, fair enough. But you're saying that according to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad himself, he committed shirk for the majority of his life. Now, hands up, any of you who can name a single prophet who's committed shirk. Remember earlier we said that prophets bring tawheed. This is the essential teaching. Name me one prophet in the history of the universe who has committed shirk. Anyone. They are protected from error by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are protected. 
But Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, according to his own belief, committed shirk for the majority of his life by believing in the ascent of Isa alayhi salam. Because according to the Ahmadiyya uh, doctrine, if you believe that Isa alayhi salam is alive in heaven, then you are committing shirk. So this is his belief, not our belief. So according to his own beliefs, he himself was a mushrik for the majority of his life, which of course rules out profited completely. So these are the kind of questions you should ask anyone who believes in this kind of thing. Not about, uh, well, did he die, did he not die? We are not qualified to answer these questions. We are not ulama. We are just ordinary students of our deen. And ask, why did Mirza Ghulam Ahmad move the grave of Jesus three times? Do you think that he thought that the grave of Yusuf was his first discovery? No. In his earlier books, he claimed that the grave was in one place. I don't remember the names. I think my um, brothers in Khatman and Abur will know all the details. You can feel free to ask them for specific details. They have all of the details. So you have um, one grave and then another grave and then, oh no, hold on, it wasn't this, it wasn't that, no, it's that. And you can just imagine this guy, in my head anyway, this is the way I imagine it, that he's reading one book, and, no, no, this looks cool, that's the one I'm going with, you know? That's the kind of image I have of him doing his research and study to try and convince his followers in a series of ever-escalating claims. So there is the, the Qadiani Jesus for you, and I think we're done. Jazakallah khair.